Hello and welcome to another edition of Adam's Music Box, where today we lost a legend, and that legend is John Mayall. Now, John Mayall was one of the most important incubators of talent in not only British blues, but rock and roll, because there was necessarily a lot of crossover between the people who came out of the 1960s UK blues scene and those who would become legends in their own right in the rock scene. And John Mayall was there for um, almost all of them. Now, it helps to understand the context of where John Mayall came from. In the early 60s in the UK, People in the sort of youthful underground loved, and I mean loved, Black American blues artists. And this was quite unique, <clears throat> because by the early 60s, while well, there were, to be sure, some very active blues artists in America recording in their traditional style, blues had already been around for almost half a century, with its roots going back well over a century by the early 1960s. And there were other forms of Black American music that were much more dominant on the pop charts and that were selling records. There was the modern R&B of the day, the proto-soul music. Um, there was rock and roll, which especially especially at that time, was very much a Black and very much American invention before it went global and became a sort of multicultural and interdisciplinary phenomenon. Uh, but blues is one of those genres that will never go away. And one of the reasons is because it's so fundamental to other genres of music. Its roots are at the foundation of jazz, of R&B, of soul, of funk, of rock and roll. And those are just some of the greatest hits. And so this sort of evergreen music became super popular among a, a certain type of young person that was listening to music, collecting records, going to clubs in the early 60s. And because some of these American albums weren't necessarily so common in the UK, many of them had to be purchased as imports, it almost became a kind of contest to see who could have the rarest or the best record. And it was this scene that really informed the, the youth and the life of John Mayall before he started performing and forming his own bands with that very distinctive style of playing and that instantly recognizable voice. In addition to producing incredibly well-performed albums, he is probably best remembered, among other things, as being such an incubator of talent. Um, just look at the first John Mayall and the Blues Breakers album, which featured Eric Clapton on lead guitar, in many ways the first real standout album that Clapton was on. And of course, he went on to many, many big things after that. But it wasn't just Clapton who was a star on that album. John McVie, a future Fleetwood Mac, was on bass. Alan Skidmore, very well-known UK saxophonist, was there, as was Johnny Ullman on sax. Jack Bruce played on the album. And you can see all of these larger-than-life names. And his next album, which in some ways was even a better album, featured Peter Green on lead guitar. And part of the sessions involved Mick Fleetwood on drums, John McVie still on bass. You see the origins there of Fleetwood Mac. So already the origins of Cream and the origins of Fleetwood Mac are on the first two Blues Breaker albums. That's quite something. Ainsley Dunbar, wonderful drummer who's played with everyone from Journey to Frank Zappa to Jefferson Starship. He got his start in John Mayall and the Blues Breakers, as did many of the people who went on to form the UK progressive jazz fusion band, Coliseum people like Dick Hextall Smith, uh, people like Theismann, the great drummer, um, Keith Hartley, the great drummer whose Keith Hartley group played at Woodstock, a great progressive sort of bluesy rock um, drummer and band leader. He got his start um, in, um, in the Blues Breakers. And so you can see that the influence that he had on others in turning them into superstars was huge. 
Uh, but he didn't always need to rely on a cast of thousands, if you were, to put together excellent blues rock albums. His solo albums that were just sort of him and the guitar stripped down, sometimes with minor accompaniment, um, were arguably just as iconic, some would say more. The Blues Alone, one of his absolute masterpieces. I'd probably say the masterpiece, but he recorded so much that it's kind of hard to choose. In the early 70s, he permanently relocated um, from the UK to the Laurel Canyon area of the Hollywood Hills in L.A., uh, which was a very diverse area of musical talent. People like Joni Mitchell lived there. Frank Zappa lived there. The Mamas and the Papas lived there. Um, later, Frank Zappa would build a full studio there. And later, Eddie Van Halen would live there. It's a very diverse area of music. And for a long time, he lived there until his home burnt down in 79, but he really stayed in California for most uh, of the rest of his life. But obviously, he played, performed, and collaborated everywhere. And the names that I've given you, of course, are just sort of a small number of the people who have gone through his band. Mick Taylor got his big break um, in the Blues Breakers before becoming a great solo artist, collaborating with people like Jack Bruce, joining the Rolling Stones. Um, so the influence there is absolutely huge. And along with Alexis Corner, he's probably responsible uh, for the advent of modern British rock and roll, which all came out of this sort of hypnotically devoted hip group of blues devotees in the early 1960s. Um, John lived a really interesting life in terms of the music he played, the people he played with, the places he went with it. Very understated in terms of his personality. He let the music do the talking for him. And now he's gone at the age of 90, a full and interesting musical life. Rest in peace, John Mayle. Like, subscribe. We'll see you next time. Take care.